Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. It's time to talk about the brain drain in Africa and when analyzing the jackpot migration phenomenon. Now, the term jackpot reflects a growing trend in Nigeria where a significant number of professionals and skilled workers leave the country due to unemployment, poor working conditions, and limited career growth. This phenomenon termed a brain drain is not new to Africa and has deeply affected the continent's healthcare, education, and research sectors. By migrating to more developed countries, these professionals seek better salaries, advanced research opportunities, and superior working conditions, leading to a severe talent deficit in their home country, and Nigeria is one of them. Now, joining us to discuss this is Dr. Adejimi Adeniji, is a postdoctoral research fellow, Shwane um, University of Technology, South Africa, and we also have Dr. Emmanuel Dansu, he's the assistant professor, Graduate School of Life Sciences. Tohoku University, Japan. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, good morning. Thank okay. you for having us. Thank you. All right, so we're talking about the brain drain in, um, in Africa, but I think let's start with Nigeria because this is what we know. This is our country. And in the past few years, we've seen a lot of people migrate to other countries. Now, um, I understand that there is a push and pull factor when it comes to this. So in a way, it seems like Nigeria pushes people out and other countries are pulling them in because they need those skills. Even though we here in Nigeria, we also need the skills, skilled workers here, but we're pushing them out because, of course, we do not have the right research. We do not have good education, infrastructure, um, healthcare. There are so many things that make people want to go away. But I want to understand how this affects a country because there's a scientific thing to this that I was trying to read yesterday. So how does this affect the country whereby people are leaving? And I would like to start with Dr. Adini Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the platform. Thank you. Um, this affects a lot because um, you find out that the skills that is needed in a very particular old country is taken out to the country. And you find out that when they get to that country, they excel for mm. two reasons. The skills is needed and there's a right atmosphere for them to operate. And having those two things actually make them grow. And you come to find out that how come that that skill that is needed outside is not being utilized in the home country. And that's where we try to explore the dynamic saying that if all of these skills, we have them in our country, create an atmosphere for them to operate. Definitely we can compete on the global scale. And um, I'm proud to say that um, Nigeria is a country where we have great minds, beautiful brains, and they are doing a whole lot. Meaning if they are exploited, if they are doing a whole lot outside Nigeria, then that means we have more greater, um, more greater skill that can be used in the country in Nigeria as well. Mm. All right, so Dr. Emmanuel, um, of course, these people are moving. They're going to other places and they're thriving there because I'm sure there's a system that works. But in Nigeria, we can't really say the same. So what are some things that you would expect um, a nation to have, not just Nigeria now, even Africa as a whole? What are some things that you expect a nation to have to ensure that the skills, um, the skilled workers, the professionals that are here still remain here and is used for the growth of the nation? Yeah, I think the key thing we always talk about is the idea of enabling environment. Mm. Uh, it is in human instinct to want to go where they can be at their very best. So once the right environment is not, is not available in a particular location, it is in human instinct, even animals, right? They, they get to move to where they can get uh, they, are basic, they can have their basic needs met and even be, you know, some more to top it. So it, that, that means that if you want to retain your best brains, you, you have to make sure that the environment is conducive for them. You know, we are, we are not, I mean, we are still battling with issues like light, internet, <laughs> and things like that. Yeah. And, you know, other people are talking about AI and how to right. integrate that into the system and everything. So uh, if we really mean business, it is a capital intensive project and we have to be able to spend a lot of money and of course corruption we know it has been as in one issue right so I, I, there was this talk by busi tembe Kwayo that was very popular at that time that you know talents will naturally go where they are appreciated and that is exactly the sad story of our nation so mm. we need the right environment where people can thrive and be at their best mm. 
So um, with this, I'm sure, obviously, this now hangs on the government. The government is supposed to be doing something, right? Maybe whatever policies, whatever measures they're putting in place, because like you've just said, people are talking about AI, people are talking about other things, people are even going to space. But in Nigeria, we're still dealing with the basic, and which is good roads, which is railway system, which is electricity, things that you're expecting that for a nation that is over 60 years, we should have that already, and we're thinking of progressive ideas that can take us forward. But in all of this, what do you think should be the government's response now? Where do we start from? How do we ensure that we have that enabling environment for people to stay here? Okay. Um, for some of us, we've been out the country, and you know, we know how it operates. Mm. Uh, one of the things I feel they need to do is to create a system. So let's take, for example, we have the academic system in Nigeria, and you find out that what exactly, we need to create a system where the academic system is also solving a particular crucial societal issue in the community. If we have that, then we begin to represent what we stand for. So if we go down to the academic institution, now we need to look at what exactly are they doing, what kind of research is being done, what do they need, what can be done. What can we supply? If we cannot supply 10 over 10, can we supply progressively 5 over 10, 6 over 10, for them to be able to compete? Now, one thing I've learned uh, over the years um, is that we have what it takes in Nigeria to compete with the world. We have what it takes in Nigeria to do expert when it comes to advance in science and technology. We have what it takes to do all of those things. What is just needed is the simple, basic need of life. If you can provide the simple basic need of life, good roads, especially lights, good internet connectivity, you would see that there will be a lot that will happen. So if the government could go down into that part and start from there, then they begin to have an atmosphere where they can thrive, do the best, and do quality research. Hmm. So thrive, do the best, do quality research. And I think you just you know, spoke about our schools. And of course, it's like the youth that are in the schools. So um, Dr. Manuel, how can the government engage the youth better? Because I feel like um, for us to even be thinking of progressive ideas, most of the people, and I say this with all humility, most of the people that we probably have um, in government right now are probably a little bit older than, than we have as the youths. And so um, maybe the idea that they have are not the best or they are lacking um, certain things because the youths are they're thinking on their feet they're so creative they have amazing ideas how do you think they can bridge that gap so if we know that we are old and probably our policies are not working let's bring in the youths with these creative ideas to ensure that there's the balance and we're doing something that is great for everybody how do you think the government can bring the youths into their policies and ensure that they are doing the right thing for the people. Oh well, I I like to always give this example of you know you can build sometimes some government they pride in the fact that uh, they have built infrastructure, they built bridges and everything. Mm. Well, the most important uh, the most important asset of any nation is the human uh, the, the human capital. The, the, that's, that's the most important thing any nation has. So if you are building houses and bridges and everything, and you are not building the people, then you are wasting your time. Because if you go around Lagos, I'm from Badagri, for instance. So we have the, 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 the popular bridge in Badagri, there's this popular bridge in Badagri that connects Badagri to Semen. If you get to the bridge, the railings have been cut off by people who are hungry and they are looking for food. So we have to start from that place of training our people, and that is that, the, and that is the place of functional education. It's not just about going to school, right? It is about mm. going to school, being able to read and write, and be, being able to look for information that you need to better yourself and to better society. So, if you are hungry, you will not be, you are, be, you are not thinking of any advancement. So, we are still, I mean, it goes back to that basic thing like we are still grappling with the issue of hunger. How can we think now? I'm in Japan, right? And you can see kids. I mean, my eight-year-old kid is already building stuff using uh, 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 there's this uh, using Scratch, you know, programming from second primary two, just primary two. That's amazing. And that's the public school, not any private school. So we have to start by building our people with functional education. 
so education has to be something that is at least the first nine years of a child's life the government should be responsible for that education and it should be sound not just I mean, I attended a primary school, a, a public primary school for that matter. In fact, I mentioned the name, you all laughed. And, and that was still a time where we could say that, you know, we could, were still able to get some substance from the educational system. So we need to build the people, and that starts from the place of functional education. Hmm. So how, um, Dr. Adejimi, I was going to ask, so how can we leverage, um, you know, people that are in the diaspora? I mean, both of you are in the diaspora now and I'm sure there are so many people that have left and they would really love to come back but if they had a system that worked they would come back but now that there is we're still talking about electricity and all these other, other things they probably are saying no it's not really for me but I'm sure there's still something that these people can do from wherever they are to ensure that we're growing our nation we're growing our economy we're helping out how can we leverage um, the people in the diaspora to still help Nigeria Yes, I'm going to answer that with two things. Number one, um, there is this organization where, um, okay, I'm the founder of the organization, and Dr. Danso as well is part of um, the key member of the organization in terms mm -hmm. of um, webinars. Now, this is what we do. We, we are overseeing, it's called Black and Mathematics Association, where we are overseeing all mathematicians across Africa. Yeah. especially in Nigeria as well. We have members in Nigeria, Ghana, Malawi. And what are we trying to do? Because we are mathematicians, we are trying to change the narrative of what mathematics is expected to be and what is expected to do in the community. A quite a number of us are in the diaspora, but we've created a platform where we bring in professors, postdoctoral research fellows, lecturers and senior lecturers in the university, alongside with uh, undergraduates, or, or, or predominantly um, postgraduate students, masters and PhD, we create a corner where they can all learn research. Now, not just research, but the application of that mathematics to real life scenarios. And we've, we've been doing that for like two years now, trying to bring in a lot of people. We've had several seminars and webinars, and this has actually helped. So now we have uh, master students who have published one paper or the other, not just a paper that sits in the shelf, but a paper that is also um, showing for policy recommendation to students. Now that's number one. Number two, personally I myself, because I'm coming up with some other um, initiative, especially in the context of Nigeria, even though I'm here in Australia, but um, I've had, I have people in Nigeria where we're actually building them up with what we have at the moment. We can't say because there is no light and there is none of these things, we can't do anything. As we speak now, uh, we created this research group to use applied mathematics to provide policy recommendation on JAPA. Mm. Now, we are also lo looking at another form of mathematics to solve other societal problems. We are collaborating with government agencies in order to do this. Meaning that with what we have back here and what the resources we have back home, we are forming a synergy where we can showcase to the world and showcase to the government that, see, guys, we don't have this, and yet we're able to provide this and do this groundbreaking research. Let alone when we have all of these amenities in place. And this we've been doing for the past two years. We've been, although we've been having good results, but we can always do better to achieve an excellent result. Yeah. So you're talking about um, quality recommendations on Jackpot. Can you just explain that a little bit more? So what are some of those quality recommendations that you currently have now? Okay. So we, con we, we consider four compartments. We have the population. We have opportunities. Uh, we have the expatriates, the brain drain people. Mm. And we have the destiny, the returnees. So we, we created a scenario where these guys, we have opportunities, they are out there, mm. but we have opportunities back home. And we, we used a, a, a good data from 2012 to 2022 with people who migrated to the US. And by the time we plot the graph, we find out that if opportunities are created back home, there is every tendency that these guys will come with the exposure that they have mm. and the opportunities back home then there will be a volcanic eruption, which is very good. It That's means right. that the change will not happen immediately, mm. but it's going to be a progress that grows with time. Because all other countries that are exposed today are good, then starts suddenly. 
yeah. and that's what we've been able to um, to say so policy recommendations such as create more opportunities and if probably those who are returning have what it takes to create those opportunities back home mm. then let them do at least a fire that is little can actually stir up to accept everyone of this I agree with you. And, and I think um, a lot of times we always think we expect the government to do so much. We expect the government to do so much. But even in our own little corners, um, we should also do something. We should also contribute. And that's obviously, you know, what you are doing with this with this um, paper that you have put together, which is amazing. And I commend both of you on that. And so, Dr. Dancer, I just wanted to get your, your final words. This whole brain drain in Africa, um, what do you think is some policy recommendations from you as well. Yes, uh, I think it's not uh, all a tale of woes, right? Uh, mm. Because brain drain can actually become brain gain. And mm. in the history of Nigeria, I, at least I, I was old enough to know, uh, when we returned to the Fourth Republic, to democracy in 1999, uh, the, the government then went on a search for Nigerian brains all over the world. And at that point in time, some of the best ministers we've ever had in the history of Nigeria yeah. emerged at that time. People like uh, Professor uh, Ngozi Okonjo, we are a doctor, obviously, we see mm, exactly. and people like that. So it is still, uh, we, st we still have uh, an opportunity to redeem ourselves. Interestingly, though, we, we don't, people don't like to admit it. Nigerians are some of the most patriotic people. In fact, to me, sometimes it looks like Nigerians are broad. I'm even more concerned about Nigeria than sometimes, mm -hmm. maybe I'm wrong, than Nigerians in Nigeria sometimes, because once you go abroad and you see the possibilities, and you're like, why can't my country be like this? Whatever I do here right, right now, I'll, I'll be so glad to do the same back at home. But, it, 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 I mean, to even interest you, when I got done with my PhD, I returned to Nigeria as a patriotic Nigerian. Guess what? During that time, we went on strike for almost eight months. Wow, and that was like that was so discouraging, and that's yeah. the kind of thing. So even when you when you want to really do your best, the system just like someone said that you know a bad system will always beat down a good person all the time. Mm. So it's uh, just these are the issues. Yeah. Uh, so basically, we can still redeem ourselves because brain drain can become brain gain. I hope that happens. I hope that the brain drain that we're currently facing um, is being turned around, and um, we start to have that brain gain. We start to bring every people who have moved abroad, all of the skills that they have, um, the professionals that have left and taking all of that skill somewhere else. I hope we can bring them back home and we start to use that to develop our nation. And like you said, Nigerians are super patriotic. Everybody wants to come back home and, you know, just have a nation that really works, have a nation that is thriving, have a nation that is growing. We're a growing nation, but I'm sure there's a lot more that we can do. We can also do it in our little corners, but would also expect the government to give Give us that enabling environment to be able to thrive and to be able to to even encourage us to do more as well anyways gentlemen i want to say thank you so much for coming it was a pleasure having a conversation with you this morning thank you so much thank yeah, you so thank much, you very much. Thank you. yeah have an amazing day. All right, so we're speaking with Dr. Ade Jimmy Adeniji, a postdoctoral research fellow of the Shwani University of Technology, South Africa. And we we're also speaking with Dr. Emmanuel Danso, is the assistant professor of Graduate School of Life Sciences, Tohoku University, Japan. And we've just been talking about the brain drain in Africa using Nigeria as a case study. And we said that hopefully the brain drain starts to become a brain gain. This is where we have to wrap it up on the show today. Thank you so much for having the breakfast with me. As always, my name is Rume Paulson. I'll see you again tomorrow. Have an amazing day.